Now you know that uh, in this third chapter of Titus, Paul's going to start with the brethren like what they were before Christ. And then he's going to proceed from there. And then he's going to make some, uh, some insightful declarations to them. He's going to make, he's going to make, draw some conclusions for them. And he's just going to open things up. And you know that verses 4, 5, and 6, he's talking about how God has come to them. He makes it very plain to us that it was a mercy of God toward us. According to his mercy, he saved us, Paul said. And, and why? Because good. God is good and he is kind. And verse 4, it says, But after the kindness and the love of God appeared. See, these things came first. And so then he makes his, he makes his progression from that point. And then, of course, then he'll, he'll say the grace of God, you know, has, has done these things. Now, I cringe when I hear the word free grace. I really, I do. I, uh, you know what's coming. Grace it's, not, it's anything but free, brethren. It's not free for God to make salvation just for every man. And grace is not free to us either. It costs a man everything. It costs a man everything to take hold of it, to lay hold of it. But, you know, I understand what people are saying when they say uh, free grace. I understand. But then, you know, it, there's, we need to express the ideas the way the Scriptures have. Because the Holy Spirit spoke in a certain way and, and for a certain reason. And this is loose speaking when we talk about free grace. We need to express them like the Spirit did. Now, it's, in Scripture, it's a free grace. It's a free gift by grace. Romans 5 makes that clear. It's, a, it's salvation. It's a free gift by grace. Specifically, righteousness is the free gift. It comes by grace. So uh, I, I never could find where the, the phrase free grace was in the Scriptures to describe any of the blessings of God to us. And so I, uh, I, I say again, and I, I think it, we can't say it too much, but, you know, whenever we're, uh, when we're inclined to consider the things of God and, and the things that God has done, it's wonderful things, and we should consider them, and, and when we're inclined to do this, we should always do it in the context of God's purpose. Yeah. His eternal purpose, what He's doing, we need to, we need to set that in the, in the framework of this. We... Uh, when we have thought of salvation, uh, then the purpose of salvation, we always should uh, view it as what God is doing. And, and, uh, and, and, and secondly, we should always see it as uh, the Lamb of God. These, these are the two things we need to understand when we, uh, when we see what God is doing. What we've, seen, what we've received from heaven is to be seen in what God has done in regards to his purpose. And so now when we can get those things in proper perspective, when we put those two kind of things first, then we can have a more picture, a more accurate picture of grace and, and what it does. Uh, as I understand it then, that uh, these two things must always come first or have them in your mind for ready reference. is God's eternal purpose, what God has done, and then the slain lamb of God. Then you, then you can proceed and, and then your study of the scriptures. Uh, independently of Jesus, you know, uh, uh, we, can, we can never speak about justification, uh, righteousness, and salvation. For Jesus is our justification, sanctification, and redemption. I want to break verse 7 in three parts. I want to look at that being justified by his grace. I want to look at that we should be made heirs. And that according to the hope of eternal life. And you're going to see that Paul just didn't grab three things arbitrarily and put them together. You're going to see how the scriptures, as you already do, you're going to get, again see how the spirit harmonizes everything together. The reason Paul referred to our inheritance according to the hope, because this is how our inheritance is realized. Hope, heirs, and hopes are linked together to be an heir and to have hope. They're be, they are to be seen uh, and understood together. They go together, and they're not independent of each other because they both speak of the future things. We are heirs. That is our rightful status as sons of God. We do stand to receive an inheritance. We are the recipients of God's grace. Our present condition right now, we are justified before God. And our status you want to see it this way we're heirs of God and our living the way we live is unto uh, hope it's our, it's, it's our position and our outlook is eternal life so if you want to break it down like that that being justified by his grace 
Now, this is a complete, you understand, and a full justification. A justification in its completed sense. It was one time it was done. Uh, I know it's fully complete because God did it. God did it by His grace. And He always does it right. He does it completed. Now, if I depended on a movement or any other kind of system for justification, I would, I would lack confidence in it. Uh, but I have, I have confidence and, and, a, and a justification that God brings by His grace. Uh, because this justification satisfies God. Yeah. Okay? It satisfies Him first. And then I know it's the right thing. First, let it be known that justification by grace involves the removal of things that the law of Moses could not do. Now, Scripture teaches us that. And the, requ and the acquiring, and the getting and the acquiring of righteousness, both of which... These two things the law of Moses could not provide for us. And our reference for this would be Acts 13, chapter. This is what it says in Ephesians 1, 7, and also in Romans. It picks up this subject. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We were made righteous after this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Justification, which is an act of God, it is. And we are told that it is accomplished by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Now, I say that for reasons reason. It's of God. Our attempts to justify ourselves are instantly rejected. God will have it. And those who stand before God in judgment on the final day, they're already condemned. They, they, they will seek justification in that day and if they're not in Christ they will not get it this is the very issue that was at stake in assembly at Galatia we, under, we remember this we have this word in Galatians knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified now the law Paul was talking about included any kind of effort uh, by men or anything that man would do to try to uh, vindicate themselves before God or make themselves just before the Lord. It was proven that man could not do this uh, just by himself. The law, the law of God proved this uh, to men. It was the law that Moses gave us. And so now we can, we can reason, we can look back and say if, now the, if the law of Moses, if we, a man could be justified by that, then what makes a man think that he can do any better? Well, you, of course, we know that man cannot uh, do any better than this. We cannot be justified outside of Jesus Christ. And so the scriptures uh, have constantly dealt with this subject all through the letters. Paul is bringing this subject up because man's desire and man's propensity uh, to uh, go back into the flesh and try to justify himself and to do things that would make him approve before God. Paul told the Philippians, this is the way Paul viewed it. He told the Philippians, and be found in him, ha not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So how, you see how Paul, so many different ways, has said the same thing to, to our brethren. There's uh, only one source for righteousness, and it's, it's not found in our abilities uh, to do them. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Uh, now, most commonly when men speak of justification, uh, it's been my experience, they only uh, address one issue of justification. For years, I, that's the only perspective I had of justification. And that was the aspect of being made righteous before God or trying to be righteous before God as men would try to do in the flesh. And so, you, and, and when you consider there's other aspects of justification, you can see how futile it is, or how silly it is, really, to try to justify yourself before God because there's much more involved in trying to be righteous or approved before God. There's other things. And so when you consider them, then you know it's just absolutely out of our reach to do these other things that come with justification. There are, there's other things going on in justification. Not only the imputation of righteousness or that God has given us righteousness, but also, you know, the removal of sin. Uh, that comes to the redemptions in Christ Jesus. He took away sin by the sacrifices himself. A, um, a, a more complete look at justification. It's, uh, in this verse, Paul, he had, 
For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this is something that God has done. He's, he's, and, he, and actually, he does this first. In whom also ye, have, ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Goes on to say, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And then, and you... Being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Now it's hard to imagine that God would impute his righteousness to us uh, while our conscience remained defiled by sin. And, and while uh, we still had a nature of sin that dominated us. Uh, because, you know, it's our nature, really, that's the issue. It's his desire, and it's fond affection for sin. So it would be hard to imagine that God would make us righteous without dealing with this first. We know that if we uh, confess our sins, God is faithful. And he's just to forgive our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Scripture says. This is something that God has done in Jesus Christ. And, when we, and he does it when we first come to him. This is what he does. And Jesus uh, and God has, has promised that he'll continue to do this as long as we abide in Jesus. God is faithful. If we abide in him, he will sanctify us and he'll keep us clean. So then God, uh, he has very thoughtfully considered uh, our condition, hasn't he? He has uh, very thoroughly addressed sin. He has dealt with the nature of sin. He has dealt with the contamination of sin. And sins are forgiven and sins are removed. He's removed them as far as the east is from the west. That's how far he's removed them. They're no longer an issue to God. And they'll continue not to be an issue if you uh, stay in Jesus Christ. Amen. The nature of sin and the power of sin is conquered. And the righteousness of God is given to them that's been sanctified as a result. What I'm saying is that Jesus was the stronger man that went in and he, he promptly bound the strong man. See, so that, that work. That we couldn't do, Jesus did. He went in and done this. So uh, there really was never a, uh, a contest in this matter, you understand, yeah. that, that God couldn't effectively and promptly and immediately deal with sin. He done it in his own, in his own way, and he's done it uh, so effectively, uh, he defeated Satan, that if you're joined to the Lord, that you can turn, sweat, uh, you can turn Satan away just, uh, just as our Lord did. Now, uh, Jesus... Showed us as an example that all you've got to do is say no and just continually say no. And by virtue of his, of the, his defeat, we can, we can have that same power over him. So we're, we're thankful for that. Amen. The saints can do the same thing Jesus did. We can say no. In justification, God has completely and he's fully dealt with sin in order that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now, preaching in a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia, Paul said these things. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. We are justified concerning all things concerning sin. That's what Paul was talking about. The removal of sin and being made righteous is receiving the new man. The new man. It's walking in newness of life. It's being a new creation in Christ Jesus. Justification is about making the sinner righteous before God. And nothing, that's, this is where nothing has been left out. God has done it all. It's a complete thing. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen. If we can agree then that God, uh, uh, through Jesus, effectively deals with sin, he's dealt with the guilt and the stain of sin, he's, he's dealt with the source and the cause of sin, and, he's, and then he's imputed his righteousness right. to us. If we can agree on this, then how can we say that God will receive men just as they are? Well, we can't say that that's right. because that's not true. Uh -huh. God will not, see men, will not receive men until they've been reconciled to him. Amen. By the redemption, it's been provided for by the redemption in Jesus Christ. If men are to be received by God, sins have got to be removed and they must be made righteous. And all this by his grace. Yeah. Um, so the gateway... The way by which justification comes to us is through His grace. And that's how we obtain. Uh, how we obtain justification is one thing. That's one matter. 
and the one who actually brings it to us is another matter. But however, the reason and the provisions, the cause of his the cause of it is his grace, and it, it remains God's salvation. Is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, and so the so the scripture categorically states, and it can state this: the grace of God that brings salvation has come to man. That means that men had absolutely nothing to do with it, with the cause of it. It's, uh, now, if justification does not come by way of the law, then it must be by the way of grace then, isn't it? Because, you know, we have those. They stand in contrast to one another. It's the, the point is made throughout Scripture and Romans and, and, and Galatians and different places that these kind of things couldn't come by the law of Moses. And so then that's where grace enter in, and that's uh, what we're looking at this morning. And so, you know, it's so that no man can boast, you see, because it's all of God. That's it's right. nothing that uh, we had any hand in. We're uh, the recipients of this. In regard to sin, it's important to point out that God has gone to the furthermost extent. Yes. And he has addressed the smallest details. If you, nobody's going to get up and... And, uh, and, and read the fine print, so to speak, and discover something uh, there. So it, uh, when we consider these things and we think about them, it, it should be apparent to men. Uh, it is to our brethren here, I'm sure. Uh, but it should be apparent to all men that uh, no one uh, can remain in fellowship with God who lives in sin. That seems like an elementary statement to make, but, you know, this is something that's... It needs to be said. Uh, living in sin didn't make any sense to Paul, the Apostle Paul, after what has been taking place in this redemption in Jesus Christ. It's living in sin didn't make sense to Paul at all. He addressed it. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And uh, so, you know, then the Paul, Apostle Paul in various places in the Scripture, he encourages the brethren, uh, don't remain, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but you know, I boil it all down in this, but... Uh, do not remain in a situation that constantly puts you at risk or constantly is putting you at a disadvantage for Christ. We talked earlier, me and another brother, about you know keep your distance. Don't get yourself in a, in a close proximity to uh, uh, sin. Uh, perhaps Eve was in close proximity to the tree in the garden. That what, maybe that's what gives Satan the opportunity to bring it to her attention. She was standing, maybe she was too close. Hey, don't even go over there, you know, is what she, uh, Adam should have told her. Uh, or told Adam, whatever the situation was. Um, distance yourself from all the influences. And we can do this kind of thing. We can do this, brother, because we've been equipped for this. You see, God has equipped us for this. Paul said, we are more than conquerors uh, through him who loved us. We are conquerors, he said. The sons of God are conquerors. This is who he was talking to. Paul said, we are conquerors. He said, better than that. He said, we're more than conquerors. So you're better than a conqueror. I'm, I'm sorry to bring this up again, but it has to be said, by and large, I don't see any evidence of this, that we're conquerors in the professing church today. I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't mean to burn you with the failures of the flesh, but I just want to bring it up. Uh, but you know why I say it? It's because I don't think Paul was exceeding the limits of the spirit that had been put within us. I don't think he was like talking over the top when he said that. Uh, he didn't do this. He, he, was, he didn't do the saints this way. When he said we were conquerors through him that had loved us, he, he, he meant it that we are more than conquerors. In the 8th chapter of Romans where this is found, Paul makes a point that there isn't any situation anywhere where the saints are that something can separate them from the love of Christ. Neither the love of God. He, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And God give us to be conquerors. See, that's what he's talking about. If you're not real familiar with the 8th chapter of Romans, then you're missing out on a very powerful account of the status of the saints of God. Let me read you. In this one chapter alone, he mentions we are sons of God. He children of adoption by uh, children of God by adoption. We're heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, the call of God, God select. So in these uh, 31 verses, he, he mentions that that many times. Uh, so this is a, it's a, he's talking to the saints of God 
uh, now we're the, we're the saints of God are not highly esteemed. We don't expect the saints of God to be highly esteemed. But we are more than conquerors. Uh, we are highly esteemed. Now the world is wrong about it. Okay. Uh, highly esteemed. It's not inconsistent with this, with this verse he has in the same chapter where he says, For thy sake we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's for the slaughter of God's glory. This is perfectly consistent with these other things that Paul says about the saints being conquerors. In this world, those who are in Christ Jesus will be triumphantly victorious because we're the sons of God. As suitable for the sons of God, he's made us overcomers. It should be right that we be overcomers as the sons of God. When we were born into this world, we weren't born heirs of God. We were made heirs of God. God made us this way. It's independent of any merit of men. Actually, the opposite was true. We were worthless, as Sister uh, Debbie said. And uh, we, we had the nature that was hostile to God. But anyway, God made us heirs. But through the working of the power of God, he has justified us. And as Paul very well put, who can lay charge to any that God has justified? God has, God has justified the elect of God. Now that Paul has put these things uh, together and verse... Now, let me back up and let's say it a better way. Now, Paul has put two thoughts together in verse 7, side by side. He has put being justified and made heirs. He's put them side by side there in that verse. He's done it for a reason. Justification puts emphasis on the heir's right to possess. If we see that God is just and a justifier, we, since we have been justified, then it's just and right that we inherit. It's proper then. We have received this right through justification through our adoption as sons. Heirship goes with sonship, you see. Adoption and sonship was the purpose of God from the very get-go. God predestined us unto the adoption of his children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That tells you right there. Uh, even now in this present life, we have a right as the sons of God to look for a full possession of what we now have only as first fruits. We have a right to look for those things. In Romans 4.13, the point is made that Abraham was made an heir of the world, not through the law, but by the righteousness of faith. The saints shall inherit the world. They shall inherit all things. That's because they are righteous also. It's a righteousness of faith, just like it was for Adam, Abraham. No person should expect to inherit from God if they're not righteous. That's why God's made us righteous. And by, by the same token, those who are righteous should live as heirs, as heirs of God. And we do. The heirs do live that way. That is, we, are, we live as conquerors. That's how we live. The heirs live this way. After the same manner as our Lord. Our Lord lived as a conqueror. He, uh, he conquered the world. Okay? All we got to do is conquer our flesh. <laughs> so he, he, said, he said it. High calling for us. Of course this promise that Abraham should inherit the world is too big a promise uh, to, for the flesh. It can only be realized in a spiritual sense. Uh, You've you, you got you to come up higher to see what God was saying there. Uh, this is a viewpoint of heaven. Uh, you know this, brother. This is the promise of faith. This can only be realized in faith. It speaks of a time when all the children of faith will be, be, will be brought into one, uh, when the times will have reached their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and all things in heaven uh, will be gathered into one according to the promise. This is what this is. In the same way as Abraham, whose faith was counted as righteousness, Noah believed God. And he built an ark. We just went over this. Uh, and he, he built the ark to the saving of his household. He condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness. A righteousness which was by faith. And Noah as well. He condemned the world by his faith. Noah's faithfulness to God was a testimony of condemnation to the world. On the final day, it will have been the testimony of, their, of the saints their life of faith. This will be a witness now against the whole world. We've done the same thing. The saints have done the same thing. We have condemned this unbelieving world by our faith in Christ. Just like Noah, who pre prepared our ark to the saving of his household, we prepared our salvation in Christ Jesus to the saving of the household of God. 
I, I want to say we've done well then when we speak a lot of ourselves as heirs and as we believe and as we uh, behave as heirs. We've done well because we've been called to be heirs. We need to keep this truth uh, like in the forefront of our thinking at all times. And uh, we should refer to one another and we should defer to one another as, as heirs and sons of God. Now, now, when we're speaking of our status as heirs of God, now, we, then we, we, there's a sense of humility that we have to, we, we, that uh, is factored in. Because we, we understand by, by whom and through whom we inherit all these things. Amen. You know, in Hebrews it says, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto his by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Heir of all things. Now you could say that, uh, you could say it another way. You could say Lord over all. Or you could say, God bless forever. The one who created the universe, both time and space, it all belongs to him by divine appointment, heir of all things. The Father has promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring first, heirs according to the promise, and the Lord shall make thee a head and not to tail. Provisions have already been made. And Christ Jesus has already been accomplished. It's a done thing. Among all the creatures who are vulnerable to Satan, brethren, the saints are the only ones who can resist him. The only ones who can oppose him and say no. This is what we can do now. One day Satan will be entirely removed. He'll be taken completely away. And we will have had our share in this. Even today, by, over, by overcoming him now, we will have, have had our share. In. And those who overcome here, the scriptures say, shall reign with Christ. Amen. Now, overcome what? Now, we've just been given, like I said earlier, the, the Lord's overcome the world. We've just been given one thing to overcome, and that's our flesh. So uh, the, uh, we can do this. But humility before God, uh, we, we live uh, uh, into this high calling. This is a high calling for sure. Uh, as with all things that God has purpose to do, though, uh, our forward looking is, uh, is to uh, an inheritance which God has done. And it's, it's something that God fully intends to accomplish, that we've been justified and made righteous affirms this. Was that clear? <laughs> but uh, the fact that God has done these things, in other words, it, it confirms that God fully intends, you know, to do this, Amen. to give us the inheritance, to possess it. Justification titles us to adoptions as sons, and it rightly permits us to be heirs and to reign with, with Christ. And this was meant to happen. Uh, we call this a divine objective. So it can't but happen. I mean, it can't but not happen. Uh, the question we need to be asked, uh, will it happen to me? Mm -hmm. This is going to happen, but will it happen to me? If you're in Christ Jesus, it will absolutely happen. I can say that. Uh, in short, an heir is someone who takes possession. He's been slotted to take possession. One who inherits, that's what it means. It is God's intention, brethren, that the saints of God inherit. Now, what is, it, what is your intention? So if your intention is the same, you will inherit the great things. The thrust of all Scripture is the future. While this verse pertains to our present circumstance, it is according to a future time. The fact that God has pointed a day to judge the world means that the future is more important then than this present day. This present time. That day is more important than this day. It is a day that not, has not come. It's in the future. Men are living. We're living unto that day. Uh, whether men agree to that or not, it's, it's beside the point. The reason for God's mercy and the reason for His grace and, and why we've been justified and why we've been made heirs is according to God's purpose, which lies in the future. It's all about the future. And all of these things that lie for ahead for the saints is for that day. This is God's purpose for the saints. It's going to happen in that day. And, and we have something as heirs. And this is, this is, I want to say this is God's purpose. This is what God is doing. And there's been something given as a purpose for the heirs also. We've been given something by God to do as well. Uh, Paul tells Titus, and, 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 and I make a transition to 
where he says, according to the hope of eternal life. And so the shift kind of changes to, an, uh, to us, you know, to what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, so uh, according to the, to the hope of eternal life. Now, this eternal life, this is the substance of our hope. That's our objective is, is what I'm saying. This is what now we're focused on. Our objective is eternal life. It's been put out before us. So that's our objective. Throughout the last uh, several months, it's the last uh, year probably, we've had many good insightful lessons and sermons on just hope, the hope that's in Christ Jesus and the hope that saves us. And Paul is clearly telling us in verse 7 that what God has done it's not for this present world, and it's not for this present time. But hope that is not seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? It is according to the hope of eternal life. All these things that's been done, such as being justified and being made heirs, is in preparation for the world to come. Heirs and hope and eternal life, all of these are future considerations. And all of... All of uh, to, are, are to be viewed in relation to what God is doing in the future. Now, the saints don't need, the last thing the saints need is for someone to get up then and point to all the things that, uh, that sparkle and glitter in this world. We don't need that kind of thing. we got this going on. The people whose conversation centers on this world, they've missed the whole point whatsoever. The saints are destined for eternal realm as heirs of, of a vast domain. Uh, faith provides for that hope, you see. And our hope is this certainty of the blessings of God. I have a full assurance that God will do me good. Not because I deserve so much goodness, but rather it's who I am in Christ Jesus. My certainty comes from my faith in God and not what I know about Him. Faith is the, is the determined counsel of His Word and His unwavering commitment to His own name God is a God of blessing. It is, it is His good pleasure to bless. And I have, and, and these are the things my faith is in, for example. And I have personally experienced it too. And I have personally witnessed it in my brethren who have experienced these same things. Our present experience of salvation then uh, fortifies our certainty of this hope and this eternal life that lies in the future. According to, now this phrase, according to, is located in a sentence in such a way that it links what God has done to the hope of eternal life. That's, it provides a, a bridge and makes that transition for us. He has justified us and made us heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, am I thinking clearly? You can tell me afterwards when I say this, that you can't have one without the other. When I, when I thought about that, I said, well, you can't have. You, can't have, you cannot be heirs of God without having been justified before Him. Right. And our inheritance brings us into agreement with God's purpose. Amen. Doesn't it? Am I, okay. Uh, it brings us in agreement then with the hope that God has given us. God has commanded life, eternal life for all men. To know God. This is the blessed of the blessings. We've been brought into agreement then. Uh, we've been made to be in agreement with Him. We have been told about God's objective. Is what it is for men to have life and have life forevermore. This is not a big secret. To make, he wants to make them sons of God through Jesus Christ. Brethren, just as sure as we have received grace to do this, and just as sure as we've been justified, we will be glorified into an inheritance that the saints will receive. We will shine brighter than the stars in heaven. And this is the certainty, and this is the substance of our hope. The word hope that the world uses is not the same for the uh, word in the scriptures. It's not the same word. The meaning of our hope is entirely different for us. When you think hope, think of blessings. Think with a full certainty and a full assurance. That's how you think. One day the redeemed are going to sing a new song, as it were, before the throne. And no man can learn the song who was not of that number which was redeemed from the earth. In another place in that same book, John beheld a great multitude that no man could number from every nation, people, and tongue standing before the throne and the Lamb clothed in white with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, do you want to be one of those who learned a new song? Do you? 
Do you want to be dressed in white, Amen. standing before the throne of God? Yeah. Well, you can be absolutely sure of this in your fellowship with the Lord. This is what Jesus is presently doing. So stick close by him, and he'll bring us to this glorious event. He is presently interceding for us, and he's bringing us ever closer to this time. In essence, Jesus is our assurance, and he is our yeah. certainty. Sure and steadfast, as scriptures say, we can speak about the things of God because he's revealed them to the saints and to the heirs of salvation. Uh, for, for his glory he's done that, and it's for our joy and for our edification he's done it. The salvation, the salvation of God is beyond amazing. It certainly is that by our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done, we can be made righteous and reconciled to him and justified. And then to consider... Through, his, through this, he has qualified us to be adopted into the family of God as his sons and children of God so that he can give us all things in Christ Jesus to reign with him. Well, this is just beyond words. This is what he's doing, brother. This is what he's already done. Uh, this is the message contained in this verse. This is none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it were possible for us to unlock this verse, it just occurred to me, if it was possible, and this verse is the gospel, if it was possible for us to unlock this verse and exhaust its contents, the world can hold all the books. And we wouldn't have enough time to read them all. It's how, that's how big it is, because you just go on and on with it. And, uh, and so then we wouldn't have enough time. But brethren, God has solved this problem. He's given us eternity, and he's given us eternal life to, to match it so that we'll have enough time to consider all these things that God has done for us that we can't get to, to now. And that will be the glory that will be due God at that time. We can look back and see what all he's done, all these fine details of it. The Apostle John had some things to say about eternal life. Actually, he had more to say than anybody else. It's quite staggering. And he had a, he had a rather fact-of-the-matter way of uh, saying it and an approach to it. He said that God was, has given us a record, a record of his son, and those who don't believe this witness calls God a liar. That's yeah. what he said. And this is the record, he goes on to say, that God has given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his son. And he says, and a man can know whether he has eternal life or not. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. So it's up to us to do that bit of an examination, but see, he gives us something to proceed with. Those who are born of God do have eternal life even now. The scriptures say that eternal life is knowing God. Yeah. Knowing God, then, is the equivalent, is equal to uh, having eternal life, then. Yeah. But then, the scriptures say, we are exhorted to, hold, to take hold of eternal life. And, it's, and it speaks of the hope of, uh, of eternal life, the hope of eternal life. We have as much, then, as eternal life as we have of Jesus Christ. That, that's how I reason this. In the ages to come, those who have been justified and have been glorified will, will be with the Lord forever. And the children of God will have eternal life in its fullness. We will be the, ha and, uh, the habitation of God. Now, in the closing here, I just want to take, I want to sneak down and take just that first phrase of verse 8. Paul said this is a faithful saying. What he said, if you want to trust in something, now this is a trustworthy and faithful saying. This kind of saying produces faith and promotes hope. Uh, this, is a kind, this kind of saying is like a, uh, a compass that always points north. It's, uh, this kind of saying is uh, faithful and trustworthy. It can be used to measure other sayings, yeah. perhaps other sayings that men would say, uh, because it's a faithful saying. It, it's, it, kinda, it has a straight edge, and it has a, it has a, a square uh, edge to it. You, uh, this, this saying here, you can use this saying. There are many such faithful and trustworthy sayings in the Scripture. And we keep them in the front of our minds. So that's what Paul was saying. This is a faithful saying. Yeah. Keep this in, in your minds and, and present this to the brethren, he would say. Uh, here's a faithful saying, and this is the one I want to close with. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, 
and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Thank you, brother.